Well, good morning and welcome to our online service of worship at Emmanuel Baptist Church. My name is Pastor Jonathan Mills and I am so glad to welcome you to our community of faith as we gather in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. By now, I'm certain you must have heard the news that we have suspended our in-person services at the request of the city's chief medical officer. Thankfully, we have a wonderful tech team here at Emmanuel and we've been able to pivot back to recorded services without any disruption. I hope you find our services meaningful and inspiring, and I hope to connect with you in the Facebook chat as we watch the service together this morning. Let us now quiet our hearts and our minds in preparation for worship as Judy leads us with the morning prelude. Good morning, Emmanuel. My name is Patricia. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you have called us out of darkness into your wonderful light. We are your sons and daughters, and we trust you and know you will continue to guide us and care for us. We rejoice because we know of your unfailing love. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Amen. I am healed, 
I am free. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true, cause I am found. I am yours, I am loved, I'm made pure, I have life, I can breathe, I am healed, I am free, cause you are strong, you are sure, you are life, you endure. You are good, always true. You are light, breaking through. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart.
Emmanuel kids. I'm so happy you could join us today with me and Jack. Um, please join me in prayer. Dear God, thank you for keeping all these kids and their parents safe. Thank you for empowering them to learn, even in these unprecedented times. Thank you for keeping them positive while they're testing negative. And thank you for just overall being here and being so strong in such an uncertain time. In your name we pray, amen. This is the scripture passage for today. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 to 10. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, the stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. When I graduated from university with a shiny new bachelor's degree, I will admit I was a bit lost. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with my life, and I really didn't know what my next move was going to be. I had gone straight from high school to university, so I was done with school. I just wanted to do something different. Well, I had heard about a group of Christians who lived in a commune in Chicago called Jesus People USA. I know it sounds a little sketchy, but you know, it had started with a group of hippies back in the 70s who wanted to shun consumer values and instead live in community like the early Christians did. So they sold everything and they moved to one of the poorest neighborhoods in Chicago. Over time, the commune grew, and by the time I arrived on their doorstep in 1984, there were over 300 men, women, and children living in this thriving inner-city community. So I cleared my debts, I packed my backpack and my guitar, and hopped on a bus for Chicago. And soon I found myself living in this inner-city commune, working with the urban poor. Now, I was only there for a few months, but it was a very interesting experience because it was the first time in my life that I didn't make any money. The community had some businesses, which were generally uh, run by the young men, and uh, that pro pr uh, produced all the proceeds for paying the expenses for the whole community. And when I say the community, it was a commune with a wide open door to the neighborhood. For example, when we had lunch in the dining hall, it was always open to the public. And most days there were dozens of homeless people eating at the same tables with the residents. <laughs> Jesus people are actively doing outreach, community service, street preaching, and so on. It was a very cool place, very inspiring and one of the most important expressions of community I've ever experienced. Community is something that we all desire, unless you're extremely introverted. And even though a true community is sometimes elusive, but when the church is really being the church, living out its calling as a community of committed Christ followers. It is a beautiful thing. I don't think that we need to sell everything and give it all away to be members of a spiritual community, but we do need to recognize the importance of participation. And we need to be willing to enter into the church community as we have opportunity. Now, <laughs> I am 
keenly aware that it is particularly poignant for us these days to think about the value of being in community. When just this week we made the decision to suspend our in-person worship services again, we are once again separated and isolated from one another. Remember how easy it was only a few short months ago to drive up to the church on Sunday morning, walk inside, and join with everyone else in worship. And then after the service, to be able to mingle with others in the fellowship hall over a cup of coffee or perhaps some cookies and cake, to shake hands, to hug, to pat somebody on the back with a smile and enter into conversation that flowed out of relationships in genuine community. Nevertheless, we can still celebrate the reality of God taking the scattered group of individuals from various backgrounds and traditions and uniting us together as one unified community in Christ. Despite our current situation, we know it will not last forever. Someday we will return and rekindle these relationships once again. And when we think about the church as a community of faith, the words of Peter express this so beautifully. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are like living stones. Peter is writing to the believers who've come to faith as Gentiles, not as Jews. And these words in chapter 2 are rich with Jewish Im imagery about the priesthood and the nature of temple worship, but it is contextualized for his non-Jewish audience. They themselves are the living stones being built up into this spiritual house. They do not worship in a temple built by human hands, but in the new temple that God has built from the individual men and women who have been made alive through faith in Jesus Christ. They have been filled with the Spirit, and therefore they themselves are the temple of the Lord whenever they gather together for worship. Let's just take a minute to look at Peter's stunning statement you are a holy priesthood. Now this might sound a little bit odd to our ears as Baptists, and indeed as Protestants, because the idea of priesthood has been uh, rejected by the Protestants. However, the priesthood that Peter mentions is different than any priesthood we have encountered in the Old Testament or in church history. In this context, it's clear that the stones, which represent all believers, are being made into a new, holy priesthood. Therefore, somehow, you and I are all part of this priesthood. So we have come to describe this in our Protestant tradition as the priesthood of all believers. You see, the Old Testament priest used to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people at the temple. But now, because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the final sacrifice has been made. There's no longer a need for priests to offer sacrifice on sacrifices. The priesthood as it once was is now irrelevant and unnecessary because everyone who has faith in Jesus has already been forgiven and they've been made fully alive through the Holy Spirit. The theologian Edwin Blum explains the priesthood of all believers this way. He writes, it means that every Christian has immediate access to God, that he serves God personally, that he ministers to others, and that he has something to give. It doesn't mean that each Christian has public gifts of preaching or teaching. In this verse, Peter is stressing the reassuring fact that through Christ, the believer is able to worship and serve God in a manner pleasing to him. This is foundational to our understanding 
of who we are at Emmanuel Baptist Church. We are a spiritual community. We are equipped by God to worship and serve him, and we work together to accomplish the work of ministry. Now, I'd like to follow up a theme from last Sunday's message about the balance between the spiritual and the practical demands of ministry. Last Sunday, I spoke about the administrative requirements undertaken by our church council and how these are necessary and important tasks, but sometimes they can feel like a distraction from the more pressing concerns of ministry. However, as we observed in Acts chapter 6, the practical demands of ministry, in that context it was the feeding of the widows, that practical need was every bit as important as the spiritual work of preaching the word. Both were considered significant to demand spiritually gifted leaders who could provide leadership in their respective ministries. So when we look at our budget each year, we divide it up into four major categories. These include mission, staff, ministry, and property. And this graph really is typical of what a church should aim for when they're planning the budget based on the advice of experts. But you know, this can be a bit of a touchy subject because there are definitely differences of opinion of uh, exactly what constitutes spiritual work. What should we be focused on? I mean, everybody agrees that mission and ministry are important spiritual priorities. And generally, the staff are also included, but property? Well, some people think that property is just not as important and maybe shouldn't take up so much of our resources. Now, you can recall that I started today's message with my experience at Jesus People USA, the commune in Chicago. I'm sure when they started out, they were inspired by the first century Christians in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. Well, I'll tell you, Chicago has a pretty cold winter, just like our climate here. And those hippies who sold everything to start a commune needed shelter. And somewhere along the way, they realized that either they needed to rent apartments or they were going to have to purchase a property. But fortunately for them, the neighborhood they lived in was full of old derelict buildings from the 1920s and 30s. Many of them had been simply abandoned. So they could purchase them inexpensively and then gradually fix them up over time. Today, they own several apartment buildings, you know, three or four floor walk-up apartments from the 20s and 30s. And they also have other buildings that support their businesses. So even those who are deeply committed to communal living recognize the need to have a home base for themselves and for their ministries. It is a false dichotomy to try to suggest that spiritual ministry can exist separately from the practical demands of finance, administration, and oversight. The same is true of our life and ministry as a community of faith. We all know that our priority at Emmanuel Baptist Church is, is spiritual in nature, and it involves both spiritual leadership and practical administration. It's not either or, it's both and. And what is true of the big C church collectively is also true for the individuals who make up the church. Let's circle back to the beginning and think about these two images that the Apostle Paul links together in, in first, uh, sorry, the Apostle Peter links together in 1 Peter chapter 2. You are like living stones. You're being built together into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. On the one hand, we're a spiritual house. But on the other hand, we're this royal priesthood. We all contribute and share in the responsibility for carrying out this ministry together. This is important when we think about what it means to be a member of the church. When we talk about membership, it has two distinct meanings that are contained in this one word. The first meaning is what some might call 
sp the spiritual meaning. We are living stones being built into a temple for worship. This is a spiritual metaphor for all believers who are being unified by his spirit in order to minister in Jesus' name. The second meaning of membership is what some people might call the legal or the organizational meaning. In order to own property, like this beautiful church building, and to be registered as a charity, we need, the follow, we need to follow certain legal requirements. This includes things like having rules for membership, the obligation to have an annual meeting of the members, and the filing of financial statements with the CRA, and, and so on and so forth. So when I talk about members in our church or membership, I'm referring to both of these meanings together. Because in our tradition, we have deliberately tried to unify these two meanings into one. You see, on the one hand, a member is a person who has repented of their sins, submitted themselves to the Lordship of Christ through faith, and they've made a public profession of that faith through baptism. On the other hand, a member is also a person who's made a public profession of faith through baptism and is actively supporting the ministries of the church through using their gifts through supporting the work uh, through their tithes and offerings and actively participating in the, the meetings and the discussions and the, the behind the scenes work that, that encourages this work of ministry. In this congregation, these two meanings are one and the same. My hope is that everyone in this congregation will make a serious commitment to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord a commitment made public through the testimony of baptism. And I also hope that you will become a member of God's church, a member of this congregation where you can be fully involved in every aspect of its life and ministry. If you've not yet been baptized or not yet become a member of the church, I'd encourage you to consider taking this next step so that you will experience the rich blessings of being built up into this spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Earlier today, I walked around the church building. Dark clouds loomed overhead, uh, both literally and metaphorically, as yet another period of stay-at-home orders have been issued. And we're required to forego the simple pleasure of gathering in this place with others who share this common commitment to Christ and who are also with us on this journey of faith. But you know what? This building is not the church. It's just an empty space. Today it is lifeless and quiet. The church is not here. You are the church. We together make up the church because we are all living stones being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Let's all commit to our full participation in God's church that we would give of ourselves completely and without reservation to the work of ministry through this community of faith. I leave you with these words, also from 1 Peter chapter 2. Read them slowly and prayerfully as you consider the amazing grace of God and how he has chosen and redeemed us to be his people.
step down into darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you so here i am to worship My name is Rohan Stewart, and it's that time of our worship service where we come before our living God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, for you are glorious and worthy to be praised. We come to you with a grateful heart and in awe of your overflowing mercies on our soul. God, we know you're moving throughout our church community, in our respective homes, in our city, in our country, Canada, and all over the world. We are in your presence. Please fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit so we can serve you totally in spirit and truth. We welcome the Holy Spirit to fall afresh on us. Touch us, Lord, and make us whole. Yes, Jesus, touch us and bless our souls. Let the true worshipers confess our sins and surrender all to our Savior, Jesus Christ. We 
We will not let COVID or anything distract us from calling your name. Jesus, as you are the Savior of our souls, touch us, Lord. Touch us, Lord. You know we are weak. You know some of us are going through life challenges. Some of us are experiencing loss. Special prayer at this time, Heavenly Father, for Gerda, as she mourned the loss of her daughter. Comfort her family, Heavenly Father, in this time. Some of us are discouraged. Some of us are alone. Some of us are struggling with health concerns. You know our concern that weigh heavy on us, Lord. But you are all we need. How great you are, Lord, to touch all your worshipers in a special way this moment. Increase your territory in our community with your Holy Spirit. Continue to pour your spirit in our pastor, Jonathan Mills, as he lead us through these times. Give him the strength he needs and the wisdom to discern your will in this spiritual community. All our virtual ministries currently active and those in planning stages to come, go before us, Lord, and let your Holy Spirit create the atmosphere to move us in your direction and not we of our own will. I can feel your presence, Lord, with us. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you for showing your mercy and your majesty around us, Heavenly Father. We are your chosen people. And we declare all praises to you that have called us out of darkness into your wonderful light as we worship you in spirit and in truth. And in Jesus' mighty and holy name, we thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hey, Emmanuel. This is the time in our service where we take our offering. Join me as I pray for our offering. God, thank you so much that we are able to still meet online, that we are able to worship together virtually from our homes. I pray that you bless the ministries at Emmanuel and so much more. I pray that you bless our community and I pray that these offerings would be a blessing to others as well. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you. 
And now it's time for our weekly opportunities. I'll start with a bit of a public service announcement. Please stay home. <laughs> We're seeing a dramatic increase in the numbers of COVID-19 infections and our city could be in grave danger if we do not all take decisive action right now. Let's all do our part and only interact socially with family members that we live with and only go out if it's absolutely necessary. Now for the rest of our morning opportunities. A reminder that despite being closed, our church office phone and email are still checked regularly. So please let us know if you have any needs that we can address or any issues that you're facing that you would like to have someone in the church support you in prayer. Uh, coming up is our Men of Honor group, which uh, is already restarted again. It's a group intensely studying God's Word, Sunday evenings at 7 p.m. If you are interested in participating, please contact Archer. Or if you don't know how to get in touch with Archer, you can always call the office for more information. Next Sunday morning, we have a guest speaker, the Executive Director of Chosen People Ministries, Jorge Sadaka. He will be speaking on the topic, Why Should We Pray for Israel? I'm sure it will be a great blessing for us all. And finally, if you haven't already signed up for our e-news, please send an email to Sadie, our office administrator. Her email is administrator at emmanuelbaptist.ca. She'll be happy to sign you up so you won't miss any important upcoming events. And now be dismissed with this benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.